I know what you're all thinking. You watched the last video I published on Cloudflare and you're thinking, James, that isn't all that useful to me. Yes, I've learned some of the core concepts, but hello world really isn't going to help me build a real application. Thankfully, developers and architects, I have got your back. Because in this video today, you're going to learn how you can build actual real web applications on top of Cloudflare Workers with Rust. You're going to do that using a framework provided by Cloudflare themselves inside the Workers RS crate. Also, how you can use third-party web frameworks, things like Axum, to build web applications that run inside Cloudflare Workers. Sound interested? Want to build high-performant and scalable web applications using serverless technologies? Yeah, of course you do. Let's get into it. So here we are in the code base for the Cloudflare sample application I've got on GitHub. The link for this will be in the description down below somewhere. So if you want to go and have a look at this code base and actually follow along, please feel free to go and start that repo, clone it, have a look at it, deploy it yourself. And where I want to start is back in the actual backend application code. So this sample application has a front end and a back end. For the purposes of this video and the videos for the foreseeable future, you're going to be focused more on this back end folder. Inside here in the source folder, you have this lib.rs file. This is very similar, if you remember, to the last video. When you ran that cargo generate and you initialized any project, you ended up with a lib.rs file that had a single function that used this event fetch macro. This lib.rs is slightly bigger because this is a real application. And the first thing I want to point out. And the first thing I want to point out actually is another macro that's available in the Cloudflare workers ecosystem. And it is this event start macro. Now this event start macro is going to run once when your application first starts. So when that isolate is first created for your worker to run, this start function is going to run once. If you're coming from things like AWS Lambda, this is the kind of thing that would run as part of your initialization phase. And all you're doing here is setting up logging. I'm using the tracing crate in the Rust ecosystem, and I'm using this console writer. I want to write the output of these logs to the console as if it was a JavaScript application doing console. Remember, fundamentally, Cloudflare workers are a JavaScript runtime. So in order to write logs from your Rust application that's compiled to Wasm, you need to write out to console.log. That is what this writer is going to do here. That actually comes, if you're interested, from the tracing web crate. If you have a look in your cargo.toml, you've got this tracing dash web. So that is where that make console writer comes from. So that's a really useful macro. If you need to do things once per environment, per startup, things like setting up logging, you could even do this to maybe load some environment variables from somewhere, whatever it is that you might be doing, you're going to do that once. We're going to set up logging once. And then you've actually got into this actual fetch function. Now I'm going to cover more of what's happening in here in later videos. For today, you're focused on actually building web applications. And what the workers RS runtime provides is this router struct. This router struct functions much like many of the routers that you've used if you've used Axum or Actix or any of the other Rust web frameworks. So with this router, you can then define your individual endpoints. So this API has one, two, three, four, five, six, six different endpoints. Some of them are posts, some of them are gets. You've got this generic on async to handle WebSocket connections. This is a chat application, remember, so you need to handle WebSockets. And then it's functions much like any web application framework that you would use inside Rust. You define in your router on a post request to the slash API slash register route, you want to run the, han you want to run the handle register function. If you have a look at the handle register function, it takes as parameters, it takes the actual request object. This is the actual request, the payload, the body, the headers, the path parameters, all that kind of stuff. And then it takes this context object, which I'll come back to in just a moment. Inside your handle register function, you've got all the code that you might expect. This is code to actually handle adding a user to the database, registering for the chat application. So a call is made out to a user repository to add the user. And if that is successful, then a response OK is returned, just saying user registered successfully. So this is going to be a text response in terms of the content type. You can equally do things like re response um, from JSON and actually pass in a struct here and that will then serialize that struct into JSON and return application JSON as the content type. Here, we're just going in plain text, just say, yay, this user registered successfully. And this same pattern is repeated over and over again. You've got handle register, handle login, handle get active chats, handle create new chat. You've got all these different things that are, you've got all these different endpoints all separated 
all separated into separate functions. Now, one of the most important things I always say when building with serverless applications is to make sure you separate your business logic from your actual function code. Now, I've not done a fantastic job of this in this code base as it is today when I'm recording this video. And I'm going to do this in later videos. I'm going to refactor this a little bit. But you want to you want to decouple the code that's actually manipulating the, the request that comes in from Cloudflow. This request object is something that is Cloudflow specific. You want to have a layer between that and your actual application code. So make sure you separate them two things out. It's one of the core principles really of any modern application development is to separate the adapters, the thing that's taking the request in, taking the HTTP request in, calling that into your business logic. So make sure you keep them two things separate. I wanna come back to this actual context object. This context object is of type root context and it has a type of app state. What exactly is app state? App state in this case is a custom struct defined by my application. This custom struct has a few properties, has a chat repository, a user repository, and then a string which holds the JWT secret key. When you actually create your router, you can use this with data function. And this allows you to pass in almost like a singleton, something that's going to be passed into every single request that's handled. So you can create a new app state object. Remember, this is just your custom struct. Then you're creating these custom properties, a chat repository and a user repository, and also then passing in the JWT secret. So your chat repository for storing chat metadata and your user repository for storing user information only needs to be created once, and then it can be passed down to all of the individual requests. The alternative thing here would be actually needing to create that app state or create your user repository as part of every single individual function. Not all that useful. This is what this is something that differs to what you might be used to typically when you're using some of the other serverless functions offerings out there. Because in AWS Lambda, for example, you would probably create your database connections, create your repositories as part of this start function. However, here we're doing it as part of the individual request. So all of this code here is going to run for each individual request that hits your worker. I'll come back to why that is in probably the next video. The couple of other things I want to mention in the actual, for a lot of this to work, you're going to need to enable the HTTP feature. So if you have a look at your cargo.toml and find the worker create in here, you see that this HTTP feature is enabled. Before this HTTP feature flag existed, the Cloudflow workers RS runtime actually had a whole lot of custom types for all the different request and response payload. What this HTTP feature does is replaces all of them custom types with types that come from the HTTP crate. That unlocks some really cool possibilities, as well as making your code all the more portable, because instead of using some custom request and response types that are custom to Cloudflare, you're using ones that are more compatible with the wider Rust ecosystem. The other thing that unlocks though, is it allows you to use frameworks like Axum to actually build web applications on top of Cloudflare. So inside this same repository, there's another branch in the repository called Legacy. And if you switch over to that Legacy branch, this is a whole bunch of other examples that I have from when I first started working with Cloudflare before I started building out that bigger chat application to demonstrate more things. So if you open up the Legacy branch, go down into the source folder, you've got this Axum-Postgres example. And you see this is using the Axum web framework. If you're not familiar with Axum, maybe you're familiar with things like Actix or Leptos. There's a few different web frameworks out there in Rust now. This example just happens to use Axum. And if you open up the lib.rs inside that Axum Postgres folder, you see that I'm still using a router. Of course, now this is a router that comes from Axum routing, not from the workers router. And you see this syntax is very, very similar. I'm defining a new route that is just to the slash, just to the base URL. And then I'm saying on the on the base URL, have a get endpoint that's gonna call the list function. On the base URL, have a post endpoint that's gonna call the add function. This is very, very similar to what you would have seen in the last video. One of the big benefits of doing this, one of the big benefits of using a framework like Axum as opposed to the Cloudflare native runtime is that it makes your code much more portable. If at some point you decide that you don't want to run in Cloudflare anymore, you want to maybe package this as a container and run it inside, I don't know, ECS Fargate, then you've got 
a more clear path to move from one to the other because you are using a framework that you could just pick up and drop somewhere else. So there is that benefit to doing things this way. Which one you choose, I'm not going to tell you which is the right one or the wrong one today. That is something that you can make in your own context based on your own decisions and your own plans for the future. And that is really all there is to running of applications on Cloudflare workers. This routing has been built into the Cloudflare runtime as a first class citizen. This means you can build monolithic, and I don't really like that word, but you can build more monolithic applications, run them inside Cloudflare workers and still get that blazing fast performance that you saw in the last video. And that is that. You've now got the ability to build full web applications on top of Cloudflare workers and still get that global deployment. Your region with Cloudflare is the entire globe. Now in the next video, you're gonna learn a little bit about persistence, something that's incredibly important to almost every application any of us build. How do you actually store data and persist data for the long haul? Interested in that? I'll see you in the next video.